Today we're gonna talk about the glycogen storage diseases, a topic that often feels overwhelming because when you first try to study it, there are too many names, too many enzymes, and too many types. But as you'll see in a second, if you understand a couple of basic principles, you have a basic framework to organize the main diseases, and if you keep in mind a simple mnemonic to remember the enzymes, you'll see that this topic becomes much easier, both for your exams and your rotations. So let's start with what you need to know about the physiology. It's actually not that complicated. Just imagine a diagram with the glucose at the top and glycogen at the bottom. The body constantly moves back and forth between these two states. When it wants to store the energy, it turns glucose into glycogen. When it wants to use the energy, it breaks the glycogen back down into glucose. Now, the process of building glycogen has a few steps. Fortunately, for this topic, you don't really need to memorize most of them. But what you do need to understand is that building glycogen is basically done by joining glucose molecules one besides another. Now, as you can see in this image, most of the time, the joining between glucose molecules is made through simple alpha-1-4 bonds. But occasionally, like here and here, different branching bonds are created. These bonds, called alpha-1-6 bonds, help make the structure more compact and less toxic. They're formed by the first enzyme you really need to remember, which is called the branching enzyme. And that's really all you need to remember regarding the buildup of glycogen. So pretty easy, right? Just one enzyme. Now, when you need to break down glycogen, you start breaking apart those bonds. And the main enzymes that perform this job are called phosphorylases. These break the alpha-1-4 bonds, and what you need to know is, is that there are phosphorylases for uh, different tissues. For example, there's a phosphorylase for the liver and a phosphorylase for the muscle. There's also an enzyme called maltase, which is sort of like a twin sister of the phosphorylase, in the sense that it performs the same job, it breaks down alpha-1-4 bonds, but instead of being in the cytosol, it's found in the lysosomes. Then there's also a debranching enzyme, which clears the alpha-1-6 bonds, which we talked about earlier. Now, once all of these enzymes have done their part, the end product is glucose 6-phosphate, not free glucose yet. To release free glucose into the bloodstream, the liver first has to use a very important enzyme called glucose 6-phosphatase right? Glucose 6 phosphatase. This one removes the phosphate group and allows glucose to leave the hepatocyte and go where it's needed. So to sum up, to build glycogen, we make two types of bonds, 1-4 bonds and 1-6 bonds, right? Those last ones are built through the branching enzyme. Now to break glycogen, we break the 1-4 bonds with a couple of enzymes, which are generally called phosphorylases. Those are like the main ones, right? And uh, they have several versions, right? One is found in the muscles and the other is found in the liver, right? And there's like a, a third version, which is found uh, not in a specific tissue, but in the lysosomes, which is called the maltase. Okay, uh, we also break the 1,6 bonds with an enzyme called the the branching enzyme. And we remove the phosphate of the glucose 6-phosphate using an enzyme called glucose 6-phosphatase. Awesome. So with that out of the way, we can start studying now the diseases. And the best way to do that is by organizing them into three main categories. So we have diseases that affect mainly the muscle, mainly the liver, or both systems. And this is really the first thing I want you to do every time you encounter a case of a glycogen storage disease. Try to deduce which category you're in. If you can do that, if you can try to like square the disease into one of the three categories, trust me, you're already 80% of the way there. So let's talk about which diseases belong to each category. I developed a silly mnemonic to remember this, and yes, I'm aware that there are plenty of other good mnemonics out there, but in my opinion, my mnemonic is a little bit better because it not only helps you to remember the names, but it also organizes them according to the presentation and it helps you remember the enzyme associated to each disease. So the mnemonic goes like this. Popeye's milk, McDonald's Pepsi, her Pepsi gum piece, ABCD. So let's go group by group. Group one, muscular diseases. In this group, we have two lines, which are the first two lines, Popeye's milk and McDonald's Pepsi. This reminds us of the two classic mainly muscular disorders, which is Pompe disease and McArdle disease. The P in Popeye's stands for Pompe, and the M in McDonald's stands for McArdle. So P, Popeye, Pompe, 
M, McDonald's, McCarl, right? Now, the drink each of them is holding reminds us of the enzyme which is deficient in each disease. M in milk is for maltase and P in Pepsi is for phosphorylase. And because we're in the muscular diseases, this is of course the muscular phosphorylase. So that's what the mnemonic helps us remember. But how do we differentiate between both diseases in a clinical case? Well, what we need to remember is that although both diseases affect the muscular system, they affect the muscular system differently. Pompe disease is a lysosomal disorder that mainly affects the cardiac muscle. The main complication you should really look out for here is hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. When this disease presents in children, they're typically hypotonic. When it presents in adults, they usually complain of muscle weakness. But the main thing in both types of patients is hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. A good way to remember this is pompe, pump. Here in pompe, the pump is sick. Macardal disease, on the other hand, does not affect the heart at all. It only compromises skeletal muscle. Patients experience exercise intolerance, cramps, and something called the second wind phenomenon, which is a sudden improvement in exercise tolerance after rest. Group 2. Hepatic diseases. In this group, we have the next two lines of the mnemonic. Herpepsi, gun piece. Now, this corresponds to Herz disease and von Gierke disease. Herz, von Gierke. Herz, Gierke. Now, for the enzymes, we do exactly what we did in the first group. We look at the initial letter of the second word of each line. P for Pepsi reminds us of phosphorylase, this time the hepatic version, and P in P's for phosphatase, meaning glucose 6-phosphatase. Now, both diseases here present with a syndrome which I like to call the syndrome of the 3H, hepatomegaly, hyperglycemia, and hyperlipidemia. The difference lies in the severity and associated findings. Herz disease is mild and just presents with that. Von Gierk disease is severe and is associated with also hyperuricemia and lactic acidosis. So let's explain all those symptoms. The hepatomegaly and hypoglycemia found in both diseases are quite straightforward to explain. You can't mobilize glucose from the liver to the tissues, so the liver enlarges and blood glucose drops. So quite easy, right? But what happens next? Well, a couple of things. First, the body starts mobilizing other energy stores for fuel, mainly fats and proteins. If you break down fats, you raise free fatty acid levels in blood. That leads to hyperlipidemia. And if you catabolize too many amino acids, you increase uric acid levels, leading to hyperuricemia. Second, if you're deficient in glucose 6-phosphatase, a buildup of which molecule will occur? Well, glucose 6-phosphate, of course. And which metabolic pathway uses this molecule? Glycolysis. This creates excess pyruvate, which eventually becomes lactic acid. And that's how you end up with lactic acidosis. Group 3. Mixed diseases. Finally, we have the mixed ones, which have the easiest lines to remember. A, B, C, D. These stand for A, Anderson disease, caused by the branching enzyme, and C, Cori disease caused by the debranching enzyme. So A with B, C with D. And what we need to remember about these diseases is that they usually present in the first few years of life with severe symptoms, both muscular, typically hypotonia, and hepatic, typically hypoglycemia. In Anderson disease, the buzzword is early liver fibrosis, and in Cori disease, the key term to watch for is the presence of limit dextrins, a small incomplete glycogen fragments that still have side branches, because, well, you don't have a debranching enzyme to cut them off. But now let's put all of this into practice, because that's really how you'll consolidate all of this information. And by the way, how can you access practice questions just like the ones I'm about to show you? It's really simple. In Lecturio, you go to the concept page of the topic you're studying. You press start, and voila, that takes you to a curated selection of clinical cases relevant to the topic. I selected two of those cases, and that's what we'll be solving right now. Feel free to pause and use what you just learned to work your way through each case. Okay, so first things first. What category of disease is this? Mainly muscle, mainly liver, or mixed? It's mainly liver, right? I mean, hepatomegaly, hypoglycemia, with no mention of muscle findings is pretty straightforward. Now, let's recall the lines for this category. Herpepsi, gum piece. 
So the diseases here are Herz and von Gierke. But how do we differentiate between them? Well, Herz disease is milder, von Gierke is more severe. And this one definitely seems like the more severe case. So all that remains is remembering the enzymes. Herz, deficiency of phosphorylase, the hepatic version specifically, and von Gierke, deficiency of glucose 6-phosphatase, which is, as you can see, the correct answer. Awesome. Let's move on to the next one. All right, let's repeat the same process here. Category. Definitely muscular, right? Now, what are the main lines here? Popeye's milk and McDonald's Pepsi, which helps us remember of Pompeii disease and McArdle. Now, how do we tell them apart? Well, Pompeii disease is mainly cardiac, while McArdle is mainly skeletal. And what do we have here? A mainly skeletal disease, right? So what is the deficient enzyme in McArdle to finish the whole thing? P of Pepsi, which is the phosphorylase, specifically the muscle version, which is the correct answer. Perfect. If you keep practicing, you'll notice that solving these cases becomes quite easy as you keep doing it. And sure, there are a few rare exceptions and weird details that can show up occasionally that throw you off, but 90% of the times what we covered here is more than enough to answer these questions without a problem. That said, you do need to consolidate the skill, so I'd recommend practicing with a few more cases and rehearsing the mnemonic with the space repetition over the next couple of weeks. Lecturio has tons of clinical cases, videos, quizzes, and even a feature that lets you create custom flashcards to help you with this. Click the link in the description if you want to learn more. Thanks for your time, and I'll see you in the next one.